Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Institute of Healthcare Management's latest webinar. And we are absolutely thrilled this evening to have the fabulous Helen Bevan, Chief Transformation Officer at NHS Horizons, to come along and regale us on the topic of power. We have got huge numbers of you registered tonight. Very, very pleased to do that. We are recording tonight as well and we will make the recording available to people uh, subsequent to tonight. We'll do a Q&A at the end, so if you've got questions, please uh, uh, go on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any stage, but we'll save that Q&A right for the end. Helen's gonna speak for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll do the Q&A. And uh, we really look forward to this. Helen, thank you so much for coming along and doing it. I'm gonna hand now over to you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, yes, good evening, everybody. And what I said I'd do um, in this session is to talk about power, because all of us who work in improvement or, or change, you know, we need the power to make a, a difference. And how I would define power is the way that Bertrand Russell, the father of modern logic, defines it, which means our ability to produce intended effects. So if as leaders and change agents, you know, we want some change to happen, we need the power um, to enable that. And what I'd also thought I would do is, uh, is produce a special session tonight, because I think if there's one thing that we see from the response to COVID-19, it's the shifts in power um, that, that are happening as a result. So I thought that I would um, do a special session this evening on thinking about power and what COVID-19 is teaching us. And just to say, I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues from the Horizons um, team, Catherine Pereira and Sasha um, Karakusevich. And um, Catherine and Sasha are gonna be looking after the, the chat box. So, you know, we'd love you to put your comments and questions and Catherine and Sasha will keep a, a, a parallel conversation going in the chat box. And what I'm also gonna do is ask them both at the end to, uh, to give a little reflection around what we've heard. So, power, you know, the ability to achieve an intended effect. I, I think it's very helpful to think about two different kinds of power. So as the frame for my talk this evening, I want to contrast old power and new power. So old power is like currency, it's like money. Some people have got a lot of it and most of us haven't. So it's formal authority in organizations and systems. And you know, it's held by a few people. Um, those leaders push it down in organizations and systems. And we are commanded to do things. You know, you have to do that because it's the four hour waiting time standard, or you've got to do that because it's the stroke policy. Okay? And the thing about old power is it's closed. So if I'm a senior leader in an NHS organization and I'm doing work with my local community, I can't command them to do anything. If you like, my formal authority ends at the door of my organization. And old power is largely transactional. It's about structures and systems and processes and governance mechanisms and holding people to account. Let's contrast that with new power. New power is like a current, it's like a surge of energy. So when people come together who have a common cause and common values, the more people that come together, the more power we have. So new power is made by many and we can pull it into our organizations and systems. It's shared, it's open. Anybody that shares our cause can be part of our new power movement. And a key thing about new power is that it's based on relationships. One of the big differences between the two is that, you know, I engage in new power because I want to, because it fits with who I am in the world versus old power, which is about what I have to do because, you know, it's my job. It's, it's, um, it's the authority, it's the governance mechanisms um, within my job. And what I'd say is that we are living um, in a world where there is a lot of tension between old power and new power. 
Um, in my job as the Chief Transformation Officer of Horizons, I get to work with a lot of futurists and scenario planners and, and future focused academics. And a lot, of, a lot of them are predicting the demise of old power. And I don't think that old power will be going anywhere anytime soon in the health and care system. What I do see is a, is a, a layer of new power and opportunities that, that, we're, that are kind of sitting on the top of that, that I think create, um, yeah, um, all kinds of possibilities for those of us who are passionate about change. And what I want to do in this talk is I want to, I want to focus on okay, the relationship, the tension between old power and new power and the way that we see it playing out in our response to COVID-19. Now, you know, we talked about, or I talked about um, new power and, it, you know, it's, it's all about relationships. And, um, you know, if, um, if I engage in change in a new power way and I have expectations that uh, change is going to happen and it doesn't happen, then I will disengage. And the next time somebody asks me to do things, you know, I, I won't bother because I, I put so much effort and energy in last time and, and you know, my expectations weren't met, weren't met. And that's why relationships and trust are so important in a new power world. So, you know, let's think about that in the context of the COVID response. And, you know, I think if there's one thing that we see, okay, in terms of um, the kind of the, the human reaction um, to COVID and the response to COVID is the power of relationships and needing to work in relational ways where we're united by purpose. And, you know, just maybe three perspectives on that. The first is crisis leadership, okay? How do we lead in a crisis? And lots of people think that, you know, crisis is, um, is about command and control, you know, taking charge and making things happen. I put a quote on the right here from Eric McNulty and Leonard Marcus about crisis leadership, and they are Harvard researchers. And, and what their research shows is effective crisis leadership is all about relationships, okay? Maybe for a small while you can do crisis leadership through command and control, but the reality is a crisis, you know, doesn't typically happen for a very short time. And, you know, a crisis can go on for a while. So actually we need highly relational leadership approaches where people understand what they can contribute and leaders who, you know, who are recognizing there's contribution and people feel that, and again, linked to meaning. You know, we're in a world where, where many of us, me included, have, have suddenly been taken out of our normal office environment and plonked um, in front of a computer screen at home. Okay? And we're having to get used to that. And again, the evidence shows us that virtual working needs to be relational. And again, just picking the quote um, here from Gremier and Maxfield on the left hand side of the screen. Okay? If we want to work as a, as a virtual team successfully, we need to be even more relational. You know, what, what does the evidence tell us, okay? As teammates, virtually, we're two and a half times more likely to, to perceive um, mistrust of other people, broken commitments and bad decision-making, okay? Compared to when we're, co um, we're co-located. And also people who work virtually report that it takes five to 10 times longer to address their, their trust concerns than face to face. So if we're gonna have successful virtual working, okay, um, then we have to base it on really strong relationships. And then the final aspect of the lens I wanted to look at is, is, um, is the community response, okay? And, and you know, in the, the, the community response that we're seeing around, uh, around COVID is, is, I think, amazing. And it's all based on relationships. And again, I took a quote here from um, Samar Arabi, who says, you know, um, when we look at, um, at the post-COVID world, you know, um, what we're seeing is when we look at these mutual aid efforts, so, we, you know, we look at these mutual aid groups all over Britain, all over the world, millions of people um, engaging to support their, their communities. And in a sense, we're seeing the future. And, and, um, and you know, Sama says, these locally designed and collaboratively built acts of solidarity which view vulnerable people as participants in their survival rather than passive consumers of assistance, okay, 
informs a model of community resilience and collective empowerment with implications far beyond their immediate um, impact. So again, you know what I'd say? Um, what we're seeing in, um, in our COVID response world okay, is, is one where often in leadership terms, you know, we're thinking around crisis leadership, uh, command and control. But the reality is we're moving into a world which is much more about new power. I thought it would be interesting um, to look at some of the metaphors um, that we see around, uh, around COVID and thinking around uh, about power. And I took some ideas here from a lot of experts on narrative and language. Um, and, you know, what's our, what's our metaphor um, around, uh, around COVID-19? And what we mean by a metaphor is when we compare two things and we say one um, is the other. If we look at, at, at many of the metaphors that we're seeing in the, in the press, in the things that people are saying, they're things that are in our list A here. Now, this is really important because do you know that we typically, we use a metaphor every 10 seconds in, in what we're saying and what we're writing. And the thing about metaphor is it gives us a kind of structure and, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, a sense of understanding. Okay, so many of the metaphors that we're seeing in a COVID-19 world are list A. And I'd say these are very old power, very command and control. Okay, we're seeing lots of metaphor around, you know, the war against COVID, the fight, the battle. We're seeing lots of metaphors that are actually, um, that, that, that got, kind of got their origins in crime. You know, we talk about lockdown, we talk about cur um, curfews, we talk about the people that break the rules on social I I isolation as being transgressors. And again, you know, when we're thinking about these metaphors, very old power, you know, you've got to stick to the rules, don't break the rules. Also, you know, um, a lot of the time we're seeing the language of, um, you know, particularly doctors and nurses as being, you know, our superheroes, our NHS heroes. Um, you know, they're, they're troops in battle, they're the front line. Again, you know, this, this idea of, um, you know, individual heroes and this idea of, you know, like we've got to batten down the hatches. And let's compare that to maybe more, um, more new power metaphors, which we're seeing in this B. You know, this is a journey. Um, yes, there's challenges, but we've got a hopeful de um, uh, destination. We're thinking about positive human action metaphors of building, forging, reconstructing. A sense of rather than individual heroes, you know, many people working together, each playing their part. And we talk about interdependence. So being interdependent means I know what my role is, but I'm very dependent on other people to achieve the, uh, the, re the results we need. And it's about resilient, connected communities. And I think, you know, for all of us, let's just be really clear about the metaphors that we're using, the language um, we're using and the, and the sense um, that we're that we're, we're putting across okay and, and thinking about that in, in power terms and are we using terms that reinforce kind of command and control top-down leadership or are we using metaphors that are of, of, you know this sense of community and connection and then I just gave an example one here this came from Spain um, but you know you've got this um, this clinician here you know arm wrestling um, with the coronavirus and and um, you know, this idea again of like, you know, the individual clinician being in battle, um, you know, with the virus. And um, so, you know, um, this is about power. Um, we want to shift power in our system. OK, if there's one term I hate us using that I think we should ban, it's this term empowerment. And, you know, so many of our leaders talk about, oh, you know, uh, we need to empower people to do their best. We need to empower people to do more during COVID. You know, whatever term we use, let's not use this one. OK, and I just put a couple of examples here. I mean, I f I'm really uncomfortable about the, the term empowerment. Because the way that we often use it, okay, is in an old power way. You know, we're saying, oh, as leaders, we want to empower our patients and we want to empower um, our, our staff at the point of care. But often we do empowering to people on the terms of the leaders, you know, not through co-production. And actually, very often when we talk about empowerment, it reinforces imbalance in power, you know, um, it doesn't it doesn't seed it. And, and again, you know, the second tweet I put there, which was one I, I, um, I put out about two weeks ago, you know, empowerment's problematic because it starts with the, with the presumption that the, the person who is empowering 
has got the power to begin with in an old power way and grants it to others. And actually, rather than um, ceding or giving away power, which is what we want in a new power way, actually, it reinforces the sense, reinforces the sense of power and control, which is what we'd see um, in an old power world. Um, so, you know, what I'd say is, um, you know, when we're thinking about, about power in a new power world, Okay, the word or term that I would use is agency. Okay, so in a sense, in a new power world, okay, we're not empowering people because a senior leader is saying to us, I give you the power on my terms. Actually, what we're doing is we're, we're building our own agency and we can have individual agency and we can have collective agency. But agency is about the power individually and collectively to make a positive difference. And you know, somebody can't give me power, they can't empower me, okay? I have to build uh, my own agency, whether it's, um, it's individual or collective. So I was gonna show you an example of this in our COVID world. And this comes from Young Shipping in Sweden, okay? And this is about building the agency of our, of our service users and, and, and people. So, you know, in Sweden, as in Britain, Okay, and um, you know, thousands and thousands of consultations are shifting from being um, face to face to virtual. But whereas here in Britain, okay, who's getting trained on how to do virtual? Who's leading the virtual? It's, it's the professionals. In a sense, we're training professionals to do virtual con consultation, but who's training the patients, you know, to work in this way, to feel comfortable, okay? And, and actually what's happening in, in, um, in Sweden is they've got this system called the living library. I just love that term where you've actually got patient leaders who are supporting thousands of service users to make that switch to virtual consultation. So we're not just giving the power to clinicians to switch to virtual. We're actually building the agency of patients to switch to virtual as well. And, you know, even in a pre COVID world, um, you know, um, we need to work in new power ways, okay? And we know there's loads of evidence that shows us that actually people who are social influencers, okay, um, through relationships, typically have got much more power to make things change than people with hierarchical power. And I'd say that as we move forward, okay, in our, um, in our journey, in a, you know, with the, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, we're gonna see this more and more. We're gonna see um, the power of, of agency, okay? The shift towards new power. And, you know, one of the ways of thinking about this um, is, um, is thinking about um, what we would call super connectors, okay? Um, this comes from an organization called Innovisor that has done um, studies with, with hundreds of organizations. What you see in most organizations and systems is that there's about 3% of people in that organization or system who are the new power super connectors, you know, the influencers. And uh, those 3% of people will typically um, influence about 85% of the other people. And these people are very, very important for making change happen. Okay, why is that? Well, actually, if you think about why change fails in organizations and, and lots of it fails very often it's because you've got two systems going on you've got the formal system and the informal one and very often formal leaders who have authority in an old power way you know and um, they're they're not engaging with the informal organization which is which is the system that can make or break change and those three percent super connectors are at the heart of this they're the people that have got the relationships, the networks, you know, they've been around in the organization for a long time, they understand the context. They're driving the perceptions of other people. So when there's like a new policy or there's um, uh, something new happening that we're not, you know, they, they create meaning for people. What we know, what the studies show us is that these super connectors are more trusted by their peers than formal leaders are trusted. And very often the formal leaders don't know who these people are. And you know, at a time of ambiguity and uncertainty, like in the middle of a pandemic, okay, these people are even more um, important and influential for making change happen. Now, so you get super connectors in organizations, you also get super connectors on social media. 
the people that are super connectors in organizations, sometimes they're the same people that are super connectors on social media and sometimes they're different people. Okay, but what the, the studies show us is, is exactly um, a very similar ratio. That, that globally in health and healthcare, okay, when we look at 85% of the content that's getting retweeted, it originates from a very small number of people, a 3.3% of people who, who tweet, who are social media super connectors. Okay? One of the things that we're seeing in the world of, um, of COVID-19 okay, is where are people going for their information? You know, um, uh, how are we learning? And people are flocking to social media like never before. So on the left-hand side of this screen is, a, um, is an oncologist, a cancer, cancer specialist, and he's saying, you know, I actually think that Twitter is probably the best source of medical information right now as an active oncologist. Because, you know, it, um, uh, you know, information, opinion is moving very quickly, and that's where it's happening. Um, on the right hand side here is a project I'm working on at the moment, um, which is an innovation platform um, around novel ideas for, um, for, for testing, um, for COVID testing. And it's part of the, um, the strategy to get to 100,000 COVID-19 tests by the end of April. So, so um, we've got this project where we're looking for novel solutions. So we're out there with the scientific community, you know, with um, the academic community, the NHS commu lab community, um, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, you know, industrial um, community and we're asking them to give us their ideas and what's interesting you know where are these ideas coming from onto this platform and you know what you can see there is around 20 percent of the people that are that are um, that are putting their ideas onto this platform are coming from various kinds of social media okay and you know it's there it's happening and in the covid world it's happening even more and again, you know, let's look at some of these uh, the super connectors, you know, these um, that, are, that, are, that are really um, emerging um, during this, this COVID era. And I just put three of them here. Um, Dave Morgan, who is from Northeast Ambulance Service, and um, Trish Greenhoe, who is a um, professor of uh, primary care, and Rachel Clark, Dr. Oxford, who is um, uh, an end-of-life care um, doctor. Okay, and you know, these aren't the most senior people in the NHS, and yet the influence that they're all having at the moment, okay, as, as, um, as social media super connectors is absolutely massive. And again, just to pick um, Trish Greenhold, you know, um, Trish wrote a paper in the BMJ um, just over a week ago around masks, and he's, and he's, and he's kind of, you know, and, um, and um, the public are wearing face masks. And there's this huge campaign and swelling of influence, again, that is, she's driving through, um, through social media. Very powerful. So how do we find super connectors? Well, you just ask people, you know, in your organisation, you know, who do you go to for, for information when you've got concerns? Whose advice um, do you trust uh, and respect? And in your organisation, I reckon you need to ask about 10 people before you work this out. Okay. And again, on social media, ask people who to follow. So um, after this, uh, this session, you can have all these slides. Tap on if you, wanna, if you want some more information about this. So what does it mean for me? You know, what it means is, um, as a change agent, as a leader, I should, you know, I can seek to be a super connector. It's about building my connections and relationships in new power ways. It's about being a model of trust and positive behaviours because, you know, if I don't behave in trusting ways, people won't connect with me in new power ways, which means that if we say we're going to do something in a new power world, we must always, always follow up because if we make a promise, a commitment, and we don't follow up, people won't trust us again. And, you know, um, most of us can't be super connectors, but we can find our super connectors, okay? You know, these people are so influential in change. Get their insights, engage um, them in change, and it's, everything is relational. So stay connected with these people for the long haul. And, you know, um, again, if we, want, um, if we want information to flow quickly in an era of COVID-19, okay, we need to work through both the formal and the informal system, okay? I'm saying this is a both and, but we know, you know, the evidence shows us if you want to get the same level of influence through top down change as these super connectors get, we need four times more people and top down hierarchically um, driven cascading of information is very slow. Okay. Working through super connectors is not slow. So 
Um, coming to the end now, but you know, what I say is, you know, when we think about how we make change happen, there's this kind of dilemma at the, at the heart of change. And um, in social science, we call this the dilemma between structure and agency. Okay. By structure, we mean the rules and mechanisms in the system, okay? performance goals, compliance mechanisms, regulation, competition, program management, incentive system. And again, we talked before about agency and what it means, the power to make a difference, activation, ability to make choices, collective action, you know, solidarity, social movements. And, and what's interesting is the predominant approach pre-COVID has been around structure. You know, if, if you're, particularly when you're a national level in the system, how do we change the incentive systems, the mechanisms? What I think we're moving towards in a COVID world is a big shift um, towards that. And whilst post COVID, you know, we'll, be, we'll see changes in the structure. You know, we're already seeing um, a lot of that. You know, we're changing the rules about um, who can do what, you know, and we're changing a lot of the governance mechanisms to make things happen um, more quickly. Okay. What we've got to make sure of is post-COVID, we're shifting to agency. And there's loads of ways that we can build agency. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this, but every one of us can build our own agency individually and collectively. You know, creating small changes one step at a time. Never underestimate the power of small changes. Emphasize progress. You know, that's a way of following up, showing that people's contributions are making a difference. Reframing our thinking, you know, a failed attempt is a learning opportunity. Uncertainty is curiosity find our crew and get social support. You know, one thing we'd always say is you can't be a great change agent on your own. However creative and innovative you are, okay, you need relationships, you need to work socially through other people. Make change routine, you know, and build change mechanisms in. Think of the best people that you can learn from. Tell stories. You know, we get told that, well, if you want to change, if you want to influence a clinician, you've got to show them data. OK, not true. OK, even clinicians are far more likely to engage in change because we connect um, with emotions um, uh, through values. And the best way of doing that is story. Think about how you can have a lot of different um, allies, you know, not just your usual group, but think in new power ways. You know, how can we unite many people? And number 10, when you're a change agent, I think you have to persist and you have to stick with this um, for the long term. So, you know, what I would say is I think that the leaders who are going to succeed in the future in the post COVID world will be those who develop the ability to operate in new power ways. Even those formal leaders who have got the old power responsibility, we need to, you know, um, we need to be working in this way. Okay, we need to work with both. But, you know, how we go about leading. Okay, how we think about the relationship between structure and agency, how we think about information flowing, you know, um, through cascading through a hierarchy versus um, flowing through super connectors, how we design the process of change, how we think about individual capability. And my very final um, slide that I hope brings all this together, you know, what's coming next in our post COVID world. And I actually, I took this, um, this is a quote from, um, from um, Pride. Okay, um, which is um, a play by Stephen Beresford. And it wasn't written in the context of, of COVID-19, but I think it should be. You know, this is about us sticking together relationally in solidarity with shared purpose. You know, and whether we march with banners or without them, the important thing is that we march together, all of us. And when we think about the COVID response, that, that's what this thing has been about, you know, from the beginning. We can't have one city um, that, um, that gets it right and another that, that, that doesn't. We can't, have, we can't have one country that becomes COVID free when it's happening in another country, you know? And, and how is this gonna end? How are we gonna come out of this, okay? Absolutely how it is gonna end is together, us united. I'm gonna stop there. Um, so what I want to do just really quickly was to just get Catherine and Sasha um, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, a quick response to what you heard from me and then a hand over to John. Hi Helen, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. We've had a very lively chat box. So I want to say thank you to everybody who's joined us and contributed in the chat. So rather than my reflection, Helen, I'm just going to pick up a couple of points that you might want to respond to. Uh, Moamba ben uh, Bennett has said, what's the best way to stop old power taking over? And that was reflected by several people saying, we don't want to go back to the way it was. So how do we do something about it? 
Um, and then Phil raised an interesting point. He said, can you learn to be a super connector or are people just sort of built that way? So there are loads of other points, but those might be two to pick up on and no doubt Sasha Great. has others. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Sasha. Yes. Um, yes, and uh, um, as Catherine said, a really lively conversation. I think people are grappling with what can I do differently? Uh, how we can. And I, I think we've got to be brave. Um, always takes me back to Margaret Mead's uh, famous saying, you know, never doubt it's a small group of people who uh, come together and change the world. In fact, it's the only way it happens. And I think rather than talking about recovery, um, we need to be bolder. We need to be saying, where do we want to get to and uh, moving purposefully in those uh, directions. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sasha. That's um, completely, um, completely agree. So, um, so do we ban, as well as banning the word empowerment, do we also ban recovery? Um, uh, I don't know. I think recovery is good in a psychological sense, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying about um, maybe we need to use other terms. So, um, um, John, back well, to you. Well, Helen, goodness me. I mean, you, you've absolutely stormed through the whole issue of challenging the traditional image of power. And you've looked at change agency and how we get things catalyzed to, uh, to be appropriate for a COVID uh, response in, or in a COVID world. So, first of all, thank you so much on behalf of everybody at the Institute of Healthcare Management, all our thousands of members, uh, several hundred of which have been in, 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 in the room tonight, as it were. Um, so if you've got questions, please do put them on the Q&A uh, uh, element at the bottom of your screen, and I'll put them to Helen. What I'd ask Helen, just while we wait for a couple of those to come through, Helen, yeah. where we have people feeling a little bit vulnerable, feeling anxious, stressed they are way out of their comfort zone at the moment but they're responsible still for leading people in an intelligent and empathetic manner can you give them yeah. any advice yeah. for how they they feel more confident and reassured about their own capability yeah. so um uh, i think it's a really really hard time at the moment and and lots of us are being asked to do things that are um out of our out of our um comfort zone and and i think you know particularly because many of us come from um you know a health and care world where there's a really strong permission culture and a sense you know um, i don't feel i've got the the power agency to make change happen and all of a sudden i'm given this um, this big job and you know what i'd say is um there's a lot of pressure on us to like do things and we're in a world of you know um, uh, action and we're judged um, by our actions but there's two things I, I, I would uh, I would say in terms of general advice okay the first thing is um, you know uh, listen to that that um, that Harvard research on um, leadership during crisis which says you know um, uh, being a leader in crisis isn't isn't rushing around doing things all the time. It's about taking people with you. It's about building um, strong relationships. So, however difficult it is, you know, um, make sure that you're um, you're building the time to connect with other people, um, to look after other people, to um, uh, make decisions um, together. Okay, um, model your own vulnerability. You know, if you're if you're feeling vulnerable, talk with your team about it because. Um, a, when you do that, it makes it, it creates the psychological safety for other people um, uh, to feel to feel express their vulnerability. And um, two, and and secondly, you know, resilience is a team sport, um, and it's about not you as an individual having to be that you know heroic metaphor leader, but it's about it's about us as a team. And then the other thing I'd say is um, every one of us has to look after ourselves. So we need we need quiet times. We need um, you know we need period of uh, of reflection, and and we have to find ways of doing it. And there's lots of ways that we can do that. But you know a lot of it, even in really really difficult situations, we've got the power to do those things. Thank you very much. Um, next, I'm going to be really quick because we've got several questions that have suddenly okay. spun through. I'll, I'll, okay. Let's be super quick if we can. Uh, Phil says, can super connectors be taught or are they genetically made that way? 
um, super connectors absolutely um, can be taught. And a lot of the reason why people who should be super connectors aren't super connectors is because they're living in an old power world and they don't kind of get it. But you no, know, um, having um, having leaders who are super relational and encourage it um, uh, uh, and um, uh, create a culture of um, working in that way and and support people to work in that way absolutely okay um, you know everybody and anybody um, can uh, can learn to work in that way and really interesting do you know that more super connectors are introverts and extroverts people think oh it's you know this extrovert person building relationships all over the place okay um, a lot of um, introverts who are kind of quiet um, people who um, who think things through make brilliant super connectors. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, Moamba's asked a good question as well, but I'm going to go to Ivy first. I uh, hope okay. you forgive me, everybody. So I I, th I I love Ivy's question. She says, "How do you get people to listen and act when you think you've made a valuable contribution? When your contribution is used, why are you not given recognition?" So Ivy sounds like one of these quieter people who's thoughtful, empathetic, makes contributions, just gets, I suspect, ignored or feels that her contribution isn't valued. How do we, how do we boost yeah. that? Yeah, um, great question, Ivy. So, you know, you know, what I'd say is um, in terms of like how some of our immediate um, uh, leaders act when, you know, they, they take our ideas and they don't thank us, but very often we haven't got very much um, ability to, um, to you know, uh, to stop that. I mean, I think um, you know, in a one-to-one, -one, maybe you can have a conversation with your leader and say, "Can I give you some feedback?" But sometimes we're not in situations that we feel psychologically safe to do that. Okay, but what we can do is we can choose to be that leader ourselves. So even if your leader isn't giving you recognition, okay, be the leader that gives recognition to everybody else. Because if you start doing that, then you're sowing the seeds and some more people will do it, some more people will do it. So, you know, even in a really tough um, situation where, it, where, you know, you're not, um, you're not being thanked and recognised for, um, for your contribution, you can be the seed of, of doing things in different ways. Super. Thank you, Helen. I'm going to ask Moamba's question now. How can uh, BAME staff who've never had the space uh, become super connectors and develop agency? Many have never been, as you use the word, empowered or had the space to do so. And uh, to be quite honest, yeah. I think that's probably a question that could be about anybody who's just never felt encouraged to speak up and become that agency creator. Yeah, yeah. So I would, uh, um, you know, what I'd say is, um, is, is, um, you know, sometimes if we wait for the formal system, um, um, you know, to be ready to, um, you know, to give us what we deserve, okay, you know, whether we're a super talented, um, you know, person from a BME background, or we're, um, you know, um, a woman who's, you know, um, keeps being overlooked um, for promotion by, um, by, you know, um, by men. Um, you know, if we wait for the system to change, we might have a very, um, very long wait. So, so in a sense, um, you know, I think we have to kind of change our lens from like an old power view of things like, you know, um, you know, I'm not being recognized or I'm not getting the promotion or I'm not being developed to a new power lens on the world. And a new power lens on the world says, um, how can I change the world in other ways? And how can I, um, how can I uh, build, uh, build my own power? Okay, so so look at so you know when I showed you that slide around uh, around change agency, make the choice even in a really difficult um, scenario um, to you know to build your own agency, and um, and one of the things that we do for instance is that we run a school for change agents, a virtual school that thousands and thousands of people do, and it's free and it's in September. So you know um, come to that, um, you know IHM is um is a brilliant source of learning and training so um you know um if you're an ihm member come and do some of those free courses build your confidence build your own skills okay and um, find the people around you who um you know can help you be the person um, that you can be and you know one of the things that um that i said around what change agents do is learn from the best so you know um you know what i'd say to you is um is do something really courageous. So the uh, one thing you could do, for instance, is you could tweet me and say, Helen, can I come and shadow you? And I'd say yes. 
because anybody that wants to shadow me can okay but it isn't just me it's um uh you know um uh uh, anybody but work out who you want to who you want to learn from and and have you know um, have the courage to go and ask them because um, the worst thing they can do is say no or I'm too busy okay but most of the time they'll say yes so so I'd say you know think about you have, you have got a lot of agency okay you just need to use it and, and think through um, how to do it jolly good well look we, we've got other questions beginning to pour in but honestly we are kind of out of time now um, yeah. So what we'll do is, I've, I've made a note of the final questions, we will get back to you. Or if you want to email me personally, uh, that's jwilks, j-w-i-l-k-s at ihm.org.uk, or through to Helen, um, you can tweet to Helen directly, she, her tweet uh, contacts were up on several of the slides, and we'll aim to get back to you, okay? But for now, Helen, I've got to say, once again, huge thank you to you. It's, uh, it's a real privilege to listen to you. Your enthusiasm and passion for your subject is truly infectious. And I know that we wouldn't have had the quantity of people coming along if that wasn't the case. So thank you. Those of you who are interested in next webinars, we have a one on population health management with Oprah's Health on this Monday coming. We've then got a carbon reduction webinar on April the 30th. We've got the fabulous Christy Adams on May the 12th talking about how to be your best and bring the best out of others, which I think should be an absolute blockbuster. But for now, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you once again to Helen and to Catherine and to Sasha, and I hope you've enjoyed yourself. This is John Wilkes from the Institute of Healthcare Management. Stay safe, stay strong, and keep doing the brilliant work that you are doing. Good night. Wonderful.